Welcome back. I'm Barry Craig. When the Republicans took control of the Kentucky House of Representatives last November, pundits predicted that at least some Democratic lawmakers would not seek re-election. With us today is one of those Democratic lawmakers, a friendly, uh, friendly and familiar face on the program, 3rd District Representative Gerald Watkins. Welcome back. Thank you, Professor Barry Craig. It's always uh, good to be on uh, television with you. You have the most highly watched TV show in Western Kentucky and, and the highest Nielsen ratings, and I, I'm honored to be on your show with I, I you. believe that's the highest ratings on the West Kentucky campus. I <laughs> to set the record straight about that. So, uh, again, uh, these are names of other lawmakers, Democratic lawmakers, who the story is out. They are not going to run again. James Kay, who is seeking the, uh, run, wants to run for judge of Woodford County. Uh, Jody Richards, a former speaker, wasn't he the longest serving speaker longest in Kentucky serving history? Longest serving speaker in Kentucky history, and he's been in the House since 1976. So uh, he just about broke the record, but <clears throat> uh, he told me last session that uh, he, he wasn't going to run again. And uh, more his age than anything else. He, I, I was going to ask you about that. And then another name is Rick Nelson from Middlesboro. Retired public school teacher and coach. Uh, he's been in the house a long time, and I uh, understand that he's not going to seek re-election either. I'm, I am surprised about James K. He, he's only in his early 30s, and uh, he uh, has always seemed ambitious for higher office. Uh, we all thought statewide office, uh, so it's a little surprising that he's not running again. But uh, you can do a lot as judge executive in your home county, so I'm sure he'll he'll be able to serve uh, his, his uh, people well there. So you think, at least in the case of, of Jody Richards and Rick Nelson, uh, that just age? That well, Jody Richards, uh, yeah, he, he told me that uh, it was basically just his age. You know, he's, I guess, about 80 years old now. He's in good health and, and uh, does great, but um, uh, it, what? What's uh, 1976 on how many years is that, 24 it's, and 17, yeah, uh, yeah. about 41 years? Uh, he's been in the house a long time, and, and uh, my mentor and one of my best friends up there really think a lot of Jody Richards, and, uh, uh, but he's served Bowling Green uh, really well. They've, they've really had a star <coughs> uh, lawmaker in Jody Richards. Rick Nelson is probably more related to the uh, change in the guard in the house than, than anything else because he he was a committee chairman and, and you know had labor and industry committee yes. very powerful chair yes uh -huh. and then uh -huh. he ran for the was it state treasurer he did and he was defeated in the primary but uh, mm -hmm. uh, but he retained his chair so so I guess what I'm saying is with, with the names we've got here with the exception of James K it might have been uh, retirement age as much to do with as the change of the guard as you put it you think I, I think so for them uh, <clears throat> yeah, even though uh, the Democrats lost the majority in the house which you lose the chairmanships and you lose leadership uh, and you don't have as many opportunities to pass your legislation so it's, it's a little more challenging but you can still serve your community well as far as uh, uh, projects, uh, trying to get some money for infrastructure projects and, and uh, uh, economic development. So you can, you can still be effective. Uh, it's not as attractive a position <clears throat> when you're in the minority, uh, but it's still an opportunity to serve. Uh, so, I, uh, you know, I'm sure a lot of Democrats are discouraged, but, uh, you know, things change and, and uh, with uh, uh, Donald Trump's low ratings and Governor Bevin's low ratings, there's a possibility that uh, the Democrats could pick up some seats in, in 2018 and 2020. But um, with Kentucky being a, a rather conservative state, it, it would uh, the Democrats would be hard-pressed to retake control of the House anytime soon, I think. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So why did you decide to uh, pack it in? Well, it's a good question, and I've wrestled with it for about five months as to what the right uh, course of action for me would be and the right decision. And uh, I've enjoyed uh, my time in the State House of Representatives. It's a great honor. Uh, I love the issues. Uh, I've had uh, passed seven bills. I, I brought back $7.7 million to redo Kentucky Avenue, the worst street in the city, and 36000 a year for the Quilters Museum, which we'd never gotten any money before. So I, I do feel like 
but I've been effective for Paducah and McCracken County in, in this capacity as state representative. But <clears throat> when I went in, I told several people I wasn't going to be a long-termer. Uh, I had some things I wanted to do, and uh, once I did them or, or uh, uh, tried, uh, then I, I wouldn't hang around. But there are several reasons why I decided not to seek re-election, but uh, uh, the biggest uh, three, number one, is it, it's a long, tiring drive. It's a four-hour drive. Out of 138 lawmakers, only two of them live further from Frankfurt than I do, and they're both only about five more minutes. Uh, further west, and it, it's a long, tiring drive, one. And two, uh, I'm basically just really tired of spending about three months of my life each year living in a hotel room. And, and then number three, the college has been very good to me uh, in being supportive and allowing me to serve in the state house. It's been a great opportunity and to be able to continue to teach in the classroom. Uh, I couldn't ask for anything more. Uh, but uh, all of my vacation days each year are used up while I'm going to Frankfurt. <clears throat> so consequently, uh, I have no vacation days, and I literally haven't had a vacation in seven years. So uh, those are the three major reasons, and then there are some other reasons, too, that are minor. But um, mostly uh, those three, I just felt like, you know, it, it was time for me to get out. And I, I wanted to announce early to allow people in both parties an opportunity to assess the situation because next year is uh, county and local races in Paducah and McCracken County and across the state and there will be a number of about six vacancies in McCracken County and I'm sure a lot of people will be uh, looking at those races and I wanted, to, wanted them to know that mine would be available also uh, so they could consider that before they made a commitment to some other office. So. Uh, I wanted to get out early and, and give everybody a chance uh, to uh, assess uh, my seat and see if it would be something they'd be interested in. But it's a great honor, great opportunity for someone, and I've thoroughly enjoyed, uh, you know, what will be six years, but uh, I've accomplished most everything I wanted to do, and I uh, just feel like it's time for me to, to move on, let someone else have an opportunity. Two quick questions. If the Democrats had held the House, would you have stayed? And secondly, the filing deadline is January 30th. Would you consider changing your mind? <laughs> um, if, if the Democrats had retained control of the State House, I would have retired anyway. Uh, I almost didn't uh, seek re-election in 2016. I remember that. And I thought long and hard about that and then finally thought that I would probably serve one more term. And uh, so, uh, irregardless of which party was in control uh, of the state house, I would have made this decision anyway. And <clears throat> excuse me, no, I'm I'm not going to change my mind. Uh, that's why I spent a long time thinking about it. I, I wanted to make the right decision because once I made it, it's final. Uh, I think uh, it would be terribly embarrassing for someone, certainly for me. Uh, to announce that I wasn't seeking re-election then a month later or change my mind and jump back in the race, I, that, that would just be terribly embarrassing and I would never do that. So uh, I feel like I made the right decision. Uh, it's firm and it's final. Uh, but now I, I would still continue to like to serve in some capacity and with the local elections on the ballot in 2018 more than likely uh, I'm still assessing the situation. I, I'm not 100% uh, decided yet on, on what or if, but seriously consider and look at running for a local uh, office next year in 2018. Uh, I am looking at that. I still would like to serve. I just don't want to drive to Frankfurt anymore. <laughs> As for local offices, uh what are we talking about, judge, commi judge, commissioner, uh, or what? Well, there there will be a lot of offices on the ballot next year, but uh, I, um, I I haven't really decided for sure yet. I, I certainly enjoyed my uh, six years on the Paducah City Commission before, and and I have discovered that outside of the governor, really, it's the local elected officials that can that have a greater input on. Uh, bringing in e uh, job opportunities, economic development, landing businesses uh, for your area. And, uh, you know, if uh, they're the ones who make the decisions to be aggressive or not when it comes to uh, job recruitment. And also expanding uh, educational opportunities. 
Um, a, a, number, a lot of people work very hard, but uh, my compromise uh, helped land the uh, Murray State University 2 plus 2 in Paducah, and that was follows on the Paducah City Commission, and I voted for incentives 100% of the time uh, that created or retained over 2,000 jobs for Paducah McCracken County. So that, that's a good opportunity. I'm certainly looking at Paducah City Commission. Uh, I've, a number of people have been encouraging me to run for McCracken County Judge Executive. I, told him I would look at it, but I'm, I'm at this point, I'm, you know, uncertain. I just want to uh, listen to people and, and take my time about deciding what to do uh, in the future. But uh, I would like to serve if, if possible in some capacity. Mm -hmm. um, who are the names circulating <clears throat> first on the Democratic side, then the Republican side, uh, going after your seat? Well, um, on the Republican side, you, you have one candidate already announced, and that's Randy Bridges. Who he, you defeated in 16. Yes. Uh, well, 2014. 14, sorry. 2014. Right. 14, right. Uh -huh. um, and so he he's already announced. Um, there was uh, another candidate, Republican, thinking about running, and, and but he has decided to work for Randy. And there's one other Republican uh, local attorney who's been interested in elective office uh, for uh, several years, and, and he's uh, looking at the race. Uh, uh, Jim Sigler, I'm, I'm not sure if he's going to get in it or not, but he is looking at it. So that's the only two names that I've heard that uh, are real possibilities. One's already in it, and the other one probably will get in it. On the Democratic side, there, there were about 10 names. It's narrowed rather quickly, though, uh, of those very seriously. Uh, looking at it, um, uh, I, I guess I probably shouldn't say one wants uh, his name kept confidential for now, uh, uh, but uh, uh, I think Andrew Coiner, a local attorney, uh, is, is looking at it. Uh, uh, McCracken County Commissioner Jerry Byer, I think, has, is, is looking at it. I, I don't know that uh, he... Uh, he uh, I think he's probably more interested in county office, but he, he's taking a look at it. Mm -hmm. um, a, a lot of people were trying to recruit Glenn Denton. I don't know if Glenn would be interested or not. He hadn't said that he was, but a lot of people would like for him to run. Um, and uh, so, But then there's a lot of other people that, that have been approached, but uh, uh, it's not something they want to do at this point in their life. Of course, one of the things to me that, 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 well, in addition to the drive that would be daunting to me is all the money you have to raise for these races. So what are we, your last race, how much money did you have to raise to be to, to win that race? Uh, I love politics, Barry, but the thing I hate about it uh, as much as anything, I guess, is having to raise, ask people for money, to raise money. And I'm a person of modest uh, finances, so you have to depend on other people to raise enough money to run a, a, a successful race. And um, my uh, three races, I raised uh, 74000 93000 and 55000 I didn't raise as much last time. I guess it wasn't as competitive as a race maybe people might have perceived, but I uh, wasn't able to raise uh, as much money. The f 2014, the most competitive race, I raised $93,000. But I think, uh, you know, $75,000 is, is an adequate amount of money to amount an effective campaign because you're, it's mostly the city of Paducah and then Reedland and Heath. So you have one TV station and, and uh, you know, a couple of newspapers. And uh, so, uh, and the houses are kind of close together for the most part. So it's easy to go door to door. So probably not as, as expensive as some races would be that are that are more spread out and, and yeah i was uh, uh, heard yesterday day before yesterday uh uh state senator reggie thomas who's running for congress in the sixth district on the democratic ticket he said mm -hmm. it would take two million dollars to be competitive in that congressional race well that's a lot of money that is an awful lot of money the the average incumbent house member nationwide uh spent like 1.8 million last election uh two million would be an awful lot of money i, I would think a person could run an effective race for less than that of course he would be a challenger he, yeah, obviously, he, yeah. He, he probably needs more money to, yeah. to build name recognition yeah. and, and to mount a successful campaign so it it may require him two million dollars but that's 
So I just couldn't imagine having to raise that kind of money. You know, it, it's just uh, unbelievable how expensive uh, political races have gotten, especially at the federal level. Well, so many politicians I've talked to through the years said that's the most distasteful part of it is you hit people up and you hit them up again. You keep hitting them up. You've got to have these fundraisers. Then you've got to get on the phone. And I'm sure you've done it and call people up and say, can you help me out? And that's a, that's a really, to me, it's a pretty unsavory part to do that. Uh, on the topic of local, and you're absolutely right. You know, I, I used to tell my students that uh, the most exciting races in Kentucky are local races. And if you think about it, you're co the most contact you have with government is the local level. Uh, you may never go to Washington. You seldom go to Frankfurt. Mm -hmm. But you go to City Hall and you go to the courthouse pretty often. Yeah. And so uh, how will those local races, do you think, affect this house? Because it's an open seat now. And, uh, and uh, that's, of course, the, the, just the numbers. The, the Republicans hold a 64 to 36 edge in the House, a 27 to 11 edge in the Senate. Um, are there any Republicans you know of that are thinking about retiring? From the State House? Yeah. Um, I haven't heard of any. Uh, now that they have the majority and they have their uh, committee chairmanships and leadership, uh, it's rather attractive. Uh, they can get their legislation passed, and uh, we passed a record number of bills. Uh, I think it was, uh, I, I can't even remember now, but it, it was just a lot of legislation last session. So they've, they've had a lot of bills on the shelves for several years that they've really wanted to get passed. So it, it's their opportunity. Uh, but I haven't heard of any of them retiring in 2018 at this mm -hmm. point. Well, going back to local races and the time we have left, uh, county judge executive, who are the names you're hearing on both sides in that race? Uh, well, it's just speculation at well, this yeah. point. But and, that's what's uh, fun. Speculation's fun. Yeah, yeah, that's right. It is. Uh, on the Republican side, uh, County Commissioner Bill Bartleman's name is mentioned frequently. Heard that. And, uh, I've heard David Mast's name uh, also. David uh, Mast was Ed Whitfield's aide. Yeah, uh, Paducah ran the Paducah field representative for uh -huh. Paducah for several years. On the Democratic side, again, McCracken County Commissioner Jerry Byer certainly has taken a serious look at it. Um, and uh, let's see who, who else. Um, I heard Dan Bose's name, but I, I don't know that that uh, be, I would be surprised if he would. He has a good job as Commonwealth Attorney, so I couldn't imagine that he'd want to run for judge executive. But a number of people have been approached, and, and uh, like Sheriff John Hayden, and uh, he's not running. Uh, uh, retired now Circuit Judge Craig Clymer, he's not interested. Sandra Wilson has been approached. She's uh, running for re-election on the City Commission. Um, who else? A number of people, uh, Judge Jeff Hines who ran last time has been approached. So a, a lot of uh, big names that would run really strong campaigns that would have an excellent chance of winning have been approached about running. But those that I just mentioned are all, they've taken themselves out. They're not interested. So it's, it's I, I guess that's the, the guess of the, of the day is who's going to run for county judge executive. These other positions that are coming open next year, there, there's already a strong challenger in each of those races uh, but uh, the county judges race I think everyone's kind of sitting back to see what everyone else is going to do. <laughs> and that's interesting because we've talked about this before and I like to call it the Gerald Watkins theory of politics and that is if you're going to run get out early and and that way you you, you can line up support can also uh, so why, what's the advantage of, of well the uh, filing deadline is January 30th, I think. It's in the month of January. Yeah. Uh, what is the advantage of, of, of waiting to run? I, I, the only advantage to waiting is to see who else gets in it, uh, because I guess the last thing a person want to do is jump out there and then have some heavyweight that is, has plenty of money and strong name recognition and, and a great reputation gets in the race, then you're just like, oh, God, what do I do now? You know, I'm going to get beat if I stay But on in the, the other race. hand, if you jump out early, you may prevent someone else from jumping out. They'll get behind you. Absolutely. I, I still believe that if you're going to run for some office, it, it's more advantageous to get out there early because 
it, it is, you know, it, it, uh, people perceive that you're going to run a strong race. You, uh, a lot of people will decide that they're not going to run this time because of that. And you can line up commitments, you can line up support, you can start raising money. Uh, I, I know too many people, especially at the presidential level, who for years have worked toward running for president and then wait to the last minute to get out there and, and the consultants are gone, the, the volunteers are gone, the, the money's obligated, it's too late. Uh, so if a person aspires to public office, uh, my belief is that, that uh, you should get out there early. Well, and of course, that's especially been the case uh, in the grand prize in Kentucky politics, the governor's race. Yes. And so I know that's not until 2019, but who are some of the Democrats out there already making noise? People are more active in the governor's race than they are these local races are. next year are already. Are. And, and of course, that's a big race. And, and uh, people are kind of jockeying for position to see who's, who's getting out there. But there are uh, some big names um, that are looking very seriously at that race. And on the Democratic side, uh, you have uh, House Minority Leader Rocky Atkins uh, uh, from Sandy Hook, uh, Eastern Kentucky, is very seriously looking at it. Uh, Attorney General Andy Bashir is very seriously looking at it. Uh, former State Auditor Adam Edlin is very seriously, uh, he's probably already committed at this point, he just hadn't declared or announced. Uh, and then there's speculation about Secretary of State Allison Lindgren Grimes, what's she going to do? She'll either run for governor or probably the U.S. Senate in 2020, one or the other. But right now, I would say she's probably leaning toward the Senate. A rematch uh, with McConnell. Right. That's uh, what I'm hearing, too. Uh-huh. And uh, let's see, who, who, oh, former House Speaker Greg Stumbo has taken a look at the governor's race in 2019 also. So... Those are the big name Democrats. Um, all of them uh, have a shot at it. Um, and on the Republican side, uh, the speculation is whether uh, Governor Matt Bevin is going to run again or not. Uh, we all assume that he will, but I've heard from uh, uh, secondhand information from Republicans in Jefferson County that he is not going to, that he is just going to run one, uh, uh, just serve the one term, and then perhaps look at the U.S. Senate himself in 2020. I've also heard he may run for Congress from that northern Kentucky district. Yeah, yeah, I've heard that too. Uh, uh, so that's a possibility. If he does, then it'll be interesting on the Republican side to see who jumps in the race for governor um, uh, yeah. from the Republican uh, side. And of course, if he were to run for the Senate, against McConnell, that'd be a rematch of a slugfest, a yeah, that, real down and dirty campaign. That would be an ugly. <laughs> it would, and fun to watch. <laughs> They're yeah. always fun to watch. Uh, and, the, and that, again, that's what always fascinates me about Kentucky politics. And I spent years trying to convince my students that Kentucky politics was every bit as entertaining as a spectator sport as Wildcat basketball. It absolutely uh, don't is. know how many converts I won, but it absolutely is. And, and what amazes me is even though this is not an election year in Kentucky, all this speculation is out there. It's in newspapers, it's on television, it's on websites. Mm -hmm. uh, Kentuckians love to do this. This yeah. is, a, this yeah. is our, our great, our great it's, sport. It's fun. It is. And, uh, and all this, this, and of course, who knows what can happen between now and 2018. So, uh, so you get to go back as a, a, as a political observer and a professor, and, and you can study this. And uh, I would certainly think that uh, having been in, in, in politics would, would make you a better teacher. You, you think about uh, Paul Simon, Illinois. Senator Paul Simon started this mm -hmm. institute, the Gerald Watkins Institute of Politics at West Kentucky. How does that sound to you? Uh, that has a nice ring to it. I, <laughs> I kind of like that. <laughs> well, I, mean, I think it would be terrific. And you think <laughs> Hubert Humphrey, and, and to, to yeah. do that. And, and you know, it was, it, 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 it uh, um, it's interesting, again, when you talk about, and I was a political science minor, if you've got somebody who's actually done this, the nuts and bolts of it, I think it makes it interesting. Uh, in the time we have left, and I know this is tough to do on just instant, what are some of the funniest things you saw in Frankfurt that you can repeat? Uh, <laughs> uh, uh, give an example of that. was, was, it was the, Some of the stuff that went on back years ago, uh, uh, Ron Morgan told me this story about uh, they, they call them turkey bills, bills that were not 
good for whatever reason. And in the midst of this turkey bill, uh, someone threw a live turkey out onto the floor of the house. Uh, any shenanigans like that you can think of? Uh, not really. There, there are a lot of light moments and, and a lot of humor. And it's, it's usually from something someone says uh, on the house floor. And, and uh, you know, it, there's a lot of pressure. KET is broadcasting everything oh, yeah. live. And you're, you got a, a, a the galleries packed with people from all across the state. And you got all these law, 100 lawmakers in there. And, and it, it's easy to make them uh, misspeak, uh, you know, to get off script. And, and the funniest moments have always been from someone who just uh, went off a script and just, you know, got a big laugh out of that. But uh, they don't do things like uh, throw the turkey out there that they used to in years past. It's a little more, um, I don't know, I guess, uh, I don't know what the word I want to use is, but it, it, maybe they... They just don't have as much fun up there as they used to and try to be a little more professional maybe, but uh, no, nothing like that ever happened uh, yeah. while I was there. And, you think it's because politics is much more polarized today? I, I think so, yeah. The, the, you don't have the, while in Frankfurt it's a lot better than it is in Washington, D.C., at least we have friendships across the aisle. Yeah, in fact, you and all, we, Republicans, Democrats, sit together. We all, yeah. There's yeah. no such thing as one aisle or the other. It's yeah, we don't everybody. do like, they do that in what yeah. D.C., but we don't yeah. do that in Frankfurt. Yeah. So it gives you a chance to get to know the Republican members, and, and it's always been important. It, it's uh, the bigger pieces of legislation, it's, it's, uh, you need bipartisan support. You don't want one party uh, voting for something 100 percent and the other party voting against it 100 percent. We need a bipartisan effort that, that a lot of people can buy into. And so those friendships uh, come in handy when you need support across the aisle. Uh, so I, I, we, it, it, uh, but, it, but like you said, you know, it's a lot more polarized than it used to be. And, uh, you know, uh, the other side is not the enemy like it is in D.C., but they're the opposition. And so it, it's, uh, you know, it's a little more stiff and formal in, in the relationship mm -hmm. than probably it used to be. Uh, so no one pulls uh, things like that, although they would certainly would be funny, but uh, we, I never saw anything like that. I, I think the, you know, just the funniest things are just different statements. Mm -hmm. uh, I remember uh, Cluster Howard, the representative from Far Eastern Kentucky, had a really but what a great name, real a, a real strong accent, and and you know how politics are and government is. You're always appointing these task force and committees to study some issue, and he stood up stood up one day and he said, "This is the studiingest group of people I've ever seen in my life." Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and uh, we all thought that was funny, but uh, it it you know. Uh, you can have some lighthearted moments, but it's a very serious thing to get up there and pass legislation, and, and everyone takes it uh, seriously. Very good. I believe we're out of time. We'll have to come back later, and your assignment will be to come up with some funny stories. Uh, okay. I, you know, I've been collecting funny political stories for years and years and years. And again, mm -hmm. you're right. I don't I don't see that there's this deep a well of these of these uh, stories as there used to be. But uh, anyway, we're out of time. Thank you. My guest is Gerald Watkins. I'm Barry Craig. Please join us next time.